Just to get started, um, I might start with you, uh, Rod, once we had a big look out, and it, I feel funny asking this question just after Stuart's called for stability, I'm going to talk about change. Um, it, you've been looking a lot at the, the rules and everything through this and the, trying to find more transparency. Do you see room for more change to water markets? Like, where are the holes and, and what needs to be done? Look, I think a number of the speakers um, spoke about some of the holes that exist in terms of water markets, in terms of understanding. I think, Stuart, you're right in the sense that um, an understanding of the fundamental rules that apply in the market uh, is lacking for many participants. So that's not saying change the rules. Yep. That's saying improve how much people know about them and how they understand the rules and how they actually work. I think another interesting point going to what Alistair was talking about, though, as well, is that we're seeing new products emerging in the market and it's hard for government and their arrangements to keep up with those sort of changes. Things like leases and forwards are becoming increasingly important risk management tools for farmers out there and it's really, you know, unless you're at the advanced end of the spectrum or you're well connected, it's really hard for you to actually get information on these. What do they mean? And even at the very fundamental end of the spectrum, I've had numerous people ask me, what's the difference between a forward and a lease? And I turn around and say, well, one actually gets you the water and one actually gets you the right to the entitlement for a period of time. And you don't necessarily get the water. It depends on what the allocation announcement is that comes with it. So there's a lot of potential. I, I think Stuart's right in the sense that we you know, the market is craving a degree of stability. Um, stability is important in terms of how the market forms, but it is also craving information. And is there anything blocking you from getting the information you require at the moment? Look, frankly, where forwards and leases are concerned, uh, they're not transparently reported on state registers uh, at this point in time. You know, we can talk to people like Alistair, we can talk to some of the exchanges that are trading these sort of things, but they're not on registers. So if we as experts struggle to find out what the prices are and what the conditions that apply underneath those, um, good luck if you're Joe Punter, basically, at this point in time. And will irrigators have to pay for your service? No, they won't. Yep. So um, that's a really important point, Warwick. I didn't mention that when I was talking before, but um, what we're proposing with these apps is that it'll have free access. Basically, we've been we've benefiting from the fact that we've got a million dollar grant here. Um, you know, this is public good information that we're accumulating here. So, this information, everything that I've showed you today, will ultimately be free access once you've logged in, basically, to the site. I'm going to go very shortly to this question up here, but I, Stuart, I'd just like your opinion on that, in the sense that, uh, do you think apps like this could help um, some of your colleagues get more information? around water market and that education you're talking about? Or is it such a hard starting point to get for some people to get their head around water markets? Oh, look, certainly for someone who's got a base level of understanding, um, a, a, an app like Waterflow would be very, very helpful. But for those who who have been... Uh, and look, there's a lot of, lot of um, farmers that are very tied up in the day-to-day -day of running their farming operations and, and really haven't even got a base level understanding of their uh, of their water the water aspect of their business, so you know water flow would uh, it might not help them initially, but in the fullness of time, yes, even those people would be helped by it very much. Our question up there, yeah, Andrew Aldridge, I'm an irrigator from uh, northeastern Tasmania. Um, I just uh, just reiterate comments that um, Stuart was making that this isn't just under the National Water Initiative. This isn't just a Murray Darling Basin thing. A lot of the rules that are being set here are going everywhere in the nation, and and it's a it's a it's it's a challenge for irrigators everywhere to get their heads around what is happening, the change, what we've got to comply with, um, and and I suppose. Talking, talking, or the question that I'll ask um, is um, sovereign risk and water. Uh, what is the sovereign risk um, to the tradable nature that water is going to become? And, and like if and if someone that. could deal, you know, uh, answer that question, that that'd be good. And also, if uh, it could be considered that this isn't just a Murray Darling Basin issue, this is irrigation everywhere in in the country. Uh, look, I'd, I'd just say, um, you know, I think certainly the, the market, we talk about the Australian water market, but it's not, you know, it's not one beast. Um, it's obviously, uh, uh, you know, a whole a collection of, of different, uh, different markets that, it, that are um, all at different levels of sophistication. And, and you know, you're very right, you know, the, the, the I suppose, uh, 
experiment that we, we started in the Murray Lane Basin is spreading across the country into Queensland, into, into Tassie, uh, across into WA. Um, and I think that the, the, there is a real sovereign risk um, for those new areas uh, that um, perhaps only go halfway uh, in the sense that, you know, that uh, the, the you know, the transparent market, the market that's, that's ultimately developed, you know, is uh, incredibly important to, uh, to really realise those assets, um, to give the right pricing drivers and the right drivers to irrigators and to give those irrigators um, security, security of title over those assets, security of title over the, the, um, the opportunity that those water assets um, provide. Um, yeah, so I think that's I think the the continued maturity, the continued focus on um, on uh, you know getting the structure right as it as it evolves across new areas and as we develop and open up new areas is incredibly important to get it right. Yeah, um, I think the National Water Initiative. I mean, you've got to think of the counterfactual, which is if you go back to the past in New South Wales, which I know well, um, you had a five-year licence. So in reality, that got rolled over every time for 30 years, but legally, the minister just didn't have to renew your licence. So the whole reforms under the National Water Initiative um, about not making that water tight, sorry for the bad pun. Um, no, we love puns. But, <laughs> yeah. However, increasing the, as you said, the certainty around the property right. So, you know, in the, again, in the New South Wales legislation, less so in Victoria, but you know, if the minister takes back a right, they've got to give compensation if you reduce the right by a certain amount. So there are limits um, which would have to be tested in court, but they're written in there to improve that security. I think it's important um, in our travels going around Northern Territory and Western Australia, for example, and I don't think Tasmania is in this case, some of their systems are well behind in terms of that security. And if you, you know, they've still got use it and lose it laws in Northern Territory. If you don't use your right, the government can come and take it at any time, you know, without a definition of what use is. You know, so if I pour some water out of the river onto my land, is that use? You know, so that, that the um, improvements under the National Water Initiative, I think, have gone a long way to making what's seen around the world as world's best practice in terms of reducing that sovereign risk around your right. Let's go to the front here. Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, hi. Uh, David, I had a question for you on your um, your historical, you know, you did the water modelling and you went back and you said um, that the change in the water profile, like in the drought or to almonds or, you know, hadn't increased the prices as much as you thought it would. And, I, and you said, if anything, it had a tempering effect on the price. And I was just wondering under your view why that was, that you thought it was having a tempering view, tempering so, effect on the prices? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and explain the, um, the results a bit better, maybe. Um, so, so, look, it was a bit of a surprise to us that when we ran that uh, modelling scenario that prices at the peak of the drought uh, with those four conditions applied were about the same. Uh, but when we stopped and thought about it, uh, it made a bit of sense because the, the carryover rules have that tempering effect because there's more water available in the dam, so more supply lowers the price uh, and, and the changing profile of the the water demand between the different commodities also had a tempering effect so there's there's why less yeah because there's less demand for for water for example I think I can't remember the number exactly off the top of my head but it's it's something like 140 or 150 thousand hectares less of pasture irrigated in in, in the basin so there's just physically less demand for water um, for some commodities. Now, there is increased demand for others, but the net effect of all of that, uh, with the carryover added in, is prices are around about the same level. Um, but, but it did surprise us a bit when we first saw the result. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've got a question up the back there. Yes, hi. Uh, my name's Catherine Tay White from Future Eye. I was a question for the panel. Um, I went to uh, manage a corporate panel on the food, water, energy nexus in North Carolina, where they've been looking at a global approach to how we might think of this nexus. It seemed to me that globally corporations were far more engaged in uh, understanding water risk and climate and um, food and the whole interactions between those globally than they are here in Australia. And I wondered um, why that is and what you think needs to be done about it. 
Someone's going to have to jump in. Anyone got a thought? Well, my first comment is I'm not sure what the water, food, energy nexus is. <laughs> um, diff no, no, different systems, like if you look at gravity-fed systems where they do have an advantage is the low energy <laughs> required for those systems. So I still think um, there are institutional issues around getting costs under control um, in certain areas, and we could talk about privatisation of New South Wales systems and their experience over 20 years of controlling those costs and flexibility. Um, but their energy costs are, are very low. You go to South Australia and it's a very different story because of the, the systems they have. Um, so it depends on the location and the commodity and a whole range of, of issues. Um, I think for government, as I mentioned before, it is um, an issue around how they um, support the market information by looking at what's happening to the resource over time, what scenarios there are, and a process for bringing forward proper risk assessment on the resource of climate change and, and having a debate around that and letting people know those risks um, within a planning framework where every 10 years you actually reset what the likely allocations are from an entitlement. So that's a very um, water resource planning process that I think has to be long term and structured. Uh, another question for you guys. If you have a question, put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you as soon as possible. Um, I, I'm interested in the restrictions of, of trade as well in the market and what you think. Uh, David and I had a chat about this just before, so you know where I'm going to go with this, David. Um, it, with water trading, um, it, it's been seen as a real benefit to be able to buy a megalitre of water from the Goulburn or the Murrumbidgee and get it to where it's um, highest, um, well, the sort of person who's willing to pay the most for it for use in the system and, um, and it's going to where the water is required. One of the things that you hear a lot of complaints from sort of areas where I am in the Goulburn Valley is that, well, for a megalitre of water to be delivered to a Newmerka dairy farm, um, through the system might only take a, a small amount of water to get it to Stewart's farm. But if I wanted to deliver it to a, a Riverland almond orchard, it's going, you're going to release, have to release more water to get that one megalitre there. But at the moment, there's no real um, recognition of those losses at the moment in the system. Is that something that you see as a problem, given, David, those graphs that you put up show that's where a lot of the water is going, to the lower reaches of the Murray? I'll have a go at that one too. Look, I, I personally don't... Look, it's just... From a point of view of managing um, information, I don't believe that uh, the systems could cope with actually um, saying, well, if you so sold a megalitre here, it, uh, it's going to be worth less as you go downstream. It's, this, the, it's, it's, it's impractical to, to implement that type of, that type of methodology. Um, and, of course, the river does run more efficiently if there's more water going down the river to those Sunraysia irrigators, for example. So there, it does take more water to deliver a megalitre to, to the Sunraysia than it does to Newmerka, sure, but it, it's, in, it's impossible to factor that in in a trading sense and do, in a practical do sense. Do you worry, given that there's been such a focus on a more efficient system in your part of the world, that this will build in more inefficiencies? No, I think there's bigger issues. Fair enough. Uh, do we have another question up the back there? Yep, James Stacey, Langhorn Creek, down the bottom end of the Murray. Um, to get to 3,200 gigs, how short is the government on money for the plan that's put in place at the moment? How many more billion dollars is it going to take to do it? That's the Productivity Commission guy can answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> All yours, John. Um, there is money allocated and depends on... if if the 450 is actually um, a decision is made that that'll actually be purchased because there's other steps involved before that is actually carried out. Um, there's money set aside and it really depends on the market price at the time, which could be a few years out from now. So if you believe um, broadly that the price will go up significantly, then I don't think the funds are enough. If for some reason the market uh, goes down, the funds will be enough. Mm. But the, the reconciliation point under the Basin Plan, so that'll be, have to be a decision for the government at the time when it becomes apparent one way or the other, and that's for 2750 or 
3,200. Politics is another question, isn't it? Go up the back there? Yeah, it is another. Well, it's gone, it's a bit, this question is a bit different. I am from Northern Territory in Darwin. Uh, we're going through an issue right now of licensing our water. Um, from uh, backstory is that in September 2015, any bores under 15 litres a second didn't need a license, you can, including commercial wise. And then we put it, we required to put a license in now, and I've applied for my license straight away, and it's 2018, and I still haven't got my license. Um, the question I'm going to ask you guys is, what are the steps that we should be doing in Northern Territory to prevent anything that could happen with what you guys had dealt with in the last 50 to 100 years? And on top of that, we have contradictory information in Northern Territory that our water, our water license is not tradable. There is, cannot be put in money value according to the government. But they've now moved from a 5% error on the water meter to a 1% error. Some people are considering thinking that that may be a move towards water trading, which we've been told that Northern Territory government would never, ever do. Do you think that's a possibility or? Mm. Oh, and <laughs> just another, 2008, I had a water license. Um, before they told me I couldn't have a water license. I got 440 megalitres for 50 hectares. I'm not sure that's a lot or not. I suppose the thing is, is that you might not want to hear it, but um, you've got to go through a period of evolution, and um, that's what's happened down, down in the Southern Connected System. We've come through, through a whole process of, uh, of where dams were built and soldier settlements were established and et cetera, et cetera. And there's been, um, and, and sometimes as much as us and private enterprise would love to speed things up. The reason why you probably haven't got the licence is because they haven't quite worked out how to do it just yet. And um, that's not a very nice thing to accept as a, as, a, uh, as a private enterprise operator, but there isn't necessarily uh, a way of fast-tracking it. Yeah, I think they just started doing licensing now for personal properties like last month. Hmm. Two and a half year wait. Yeah. And look, and, and, I, and I might say, when, don't be concerned about the risk of, of water trading being introduced because it has actually brought an enormous amount of, of, of benefit to, um, uh, to, to people throughout the Southern Connected System because certainly in, um, in those drought years when uh, there's, there's, there's traditionally been a fair bit of criticism of, oh, you know, water should never have been separated from land and never have been allowed to sold, et cetera, et cetera. There's always a lot of rhetoric around that. But the reality is, is that that's not the tragedy. The tragedy has been that people needed to do that. And, and certainly those, in those drought years when there was no other way of getting the bank off your back other than to sell some permanent water, it was, uh, it was a huge relief to a lot of those uh, irrigators who were able to do that. So water trading has brought a, a lot of benefits. It's just that you know, we, we now, as I pointed out in what I said, is that I'm just a bit concerned that it's gone a bit too far, really. And um, the area that is going to be the net loser of, of water, which I believe our area is going to be one of them, it hasn't been, it hasn't been uh, properly taken into account um, for what looks reasonably inevitable at the moment. So just, just adding to that as well, I think you're at the start of a journey that a lot of groundwater systems are actually at around Australia as well. Groundwater trading is something that is emerging in many places uh, around Australia. So uh, what you're facing is being seen in South Australia, is in Queensland, uh, and is even evolving across New South Wales in my observation as well. Um, what we'd observe and what I observe from some studies we've done on these sort of areas is that trading actually is really beneficial in those areas. But uh, to to start with, it was critical to have a really good understanding of the underlying hydrology. And that's always a massive challenge in groundwater systems. Once you've got that understanding of the hydrology, then the licensing naturally needs to follow. But ideally, in setting up those licensing arrangements, there's clarity around how you can actually trade. And trading in a groundwater sense is actually sometimes quite complicated because how connected are the groundwater zones? It's a lot less obvious for a groundwater system than it is for a surface water system. But these issues are being tackled and, and are being understood. And I think starting with something like metering is a really good place to start because if you don't know what's being taken out across the area, um, well, you're lacking a critical piece in the puzzle. 
But I think that um, there's great potential here. I think there's great potential for the states to learn from each other because many of them are going on, on this journey and some of them are further down the track. Um, so it's not a straight answer to you in terms of where you're at, but I, from what I'd observe in other locations, this has enabled movement of groundwater across different areas, which has actually worked very much to the benefit of areas, particularly where there are a diverse set of crops being grown in that area, and particularly where you might be in different climatic zones or you might witness different rainfall events, which means that you, know, you one year might have more water that's landed on your property and not far away, they've got less. Your ability to actually use a market to realise some value from the water that you're no longer needing this year um, can actually add to the bottom line of your business. Dave, I know you want to comment as well. Yeah, well, I actually wanted to go back to uh, the trade restriction question, if I can. Oh, wow, yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was a bit, bit slow to sorry, get to mic. So, um, yes, yeah, so I guess we make the point that we think trade in, in the Southern Basin, yeah, it's working. You know, we're seeing water move about the place. And our comments around uh, trade restrictions, and I guess John touched on this, is that uh, there's probably some work required on having a look at the costs and the benefits and the risks of... Uh, freeing up some of that trade because there, there are hydrological reasons why you can't have trade from one area to the other or it needs to be limited but the gap in my mind is the for example I'll pick on the Murrumbidgee the 100 gig uh, intervalley transfer limit why 100 uh, what are the costs and benefits and risks of going to 200 uh, and and to me that sort of detailed analysis is what's uh, lacking uh, and and maybe that's the what we need to do to have a think about getting water to, to the places down the southern part of the basin. We need to do some of that thinking. Yeah, for those who might not know, there's a lot of caps on that can be hit if a certain amount of water's moved from one region to the other, um, and that halts trade. So Murrumbidgee is a classic one because that is so on again, off again relationship in water trading in the Murrumbidgee where you've got to wait for someone to sell back water back into that region before it's opened up again for somebody to, to trade out. John, do you have something to add on, on that? I just want to add a bit of a note of caution on some of the groundwater trading and things. This stuff is not costless. So hydrology, you know, the administration, et cetera. So, I mean, it's really um, just because a few people want to trade, I don't think government should jump. It's a matter of actually looking at the costs and benefits because this is an ongoing cost, which in the rest of established states is borne by the users. So you know, as a user in groundwater in southern New South Wales, that it costs you, you know, $8 per megalitre pumped with a fixed cost for them to manage that resource. So it's just a note, and I think um, some places in Queensland are running into this, where a few people are demanding trade, but when they really look at it, the benefits of trade do not outweigh the costs of actually setting up the trade system. So in some of these new areas, I think it's, as you're right, with the evolution in the areas, but it, it's got to be an evolution, not just jump to this perfect system. You've got to actually look at what the demands are. Yeah, and I think just, just on that quickly, the, the Basin Plan recognises that, that the, the default for surface water is that trade should be allowed unless you can prove otherwise, whereas for groundwater it's, it's the reverse. Uh, you know, trade isn't allowed unless you can prove it is OK. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question down the front here. Sorry. Sorry for, thanks for waiting. Yeah, Marianne Graham from Rural Co. Water. Stuart, your comments on the jam ID and, and I was just wondering... You feel obviously there's some problems there with the infrastructure and the cost. What what sort of solution would you feel would be the way to go? Oh, well, there's a, there's plenty that can be done. I think probably um, the uh, it's really a bit of a Victorian centric view, um, especially given that Gold Murray Water is a is a wholly Victorian government owned water authority, unlike the way they've set things up in New South Wales. But but I think they're they're obsessed with well, they certainly are obsessed with. Uh, not allowing any form of cross subsidy. So, for example, the fixed rates and charges on on my property are in excess of hundred thousand dollars a year, whether I use the water or I don't. And um, to own an amount of water that was originally required to to irrigate that area, the um, the entitlement storage fee, which is the fee at attached to the water share, is actually really very very low. And so. Um, it's uh, the point is is that they won't they won't increase the price of entitlement storage fee, which is the fee against water share, in order to reduce the, uh, the 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 charges against against land known as the infrastructure access fee in Victoria. They won't reduce that, and they and they and their their argument continually is 
well, we're just not going to, we're not going to cross subsidise. So we're just not going to do it. Full stop. Um, and some of the other things that happen, like we've got. Uh, a, an absolute debacle going on at the moment in relation to the gold and IVT. It's, um, it's been appallingly um, uh, managed in, in this particular season. Um, it's, the mechanism's been there for a long time without going in, into any great detail. But That's inter-valley trade. Why, yeah. why do you think it hasn't been managed well, I suppose, just for people who might not know? Well, there's a, there's a trade-out limit... Um, so uh, from Goulburn to Murray, and and it hasn't been possible to trade water between from Goulburn to Murray. It's been possible to trade water from Murray to Goulburn, but not from Goulburn to Murray. And it's because there's a inter valley trading limit. Now, uh, what you've been able to do as a Victorian Murray irrigator is that you've been able to avoid the uh, inter valley trading limit uh, by setting up a uh, a tagged entitlement. Uh, a, a tagged shell, if you like, and um, that whole process of unrolling that uh, facility uh, uh, to every irrigator in in the Victorian Murray has not, well, hasn't. There's been no marketing campaign. It's a it's a matter of who's known versus who hasn't known. And um, as a Victorian Golden Murray Water Murray customer, you've had access to the to to the mechanism. But as a Victorian Lower Murray Water customer, you have not had access to the mechanism, which is just an extraordinary uh, inconsistency given that both systems are control ultimately controlled by the Victorian government. How does that come about? And I suppose just coming back to that question too, Gold Murray Water itself as an entity has talked a lot about losing water that it can manage yes. and it can deliver and there's concern for its um, future. There's been a report from the Victorian Minister about its um, viability for the future. Is that something you worry about as a Yes, together? absolutely. Mm. Absolutely, because I think there's a very high risk, uh, as I alluded to, um, of, of uh, a, a mammoth stranded asset issue, uh, uh, particularly um, if the uh, 450 GL uh, is taken from consumptive use for the basin plan, well, there's just the, the footprint's too large and, and, and where's the footprint of irrigation going to be reduced and what's that going to mean when it's reduced? Well, it's going to mean an area like that, and as you can see from that slide, there's, there's, there's just so much infrastructure there, and it won't have a use. And $2 billion has just been spent. $2 billion has just been spent on all that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question? Do we have uh, another one? Oh, one here? Yep. Uh, Mike Foley from Fairfax. Just a broad question um, to the panel. How you see the relative benefits of the... I guess relatively new trading arrangements in the Southern Basin um, for smaller farmers compared to larger corporates? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'll have a bit of a crack. I mean, I, I um, yeah, ultimately, there's information. So ultimately, uh, I think um, the, the key has been f there, there are probably different levels of information and understanding as to as the opportunities for some of these uh, uh, for, for some of the, the irrigators, um, and and certainly those with more to lose or gain have probably informed themselves um, more quickly than than others. But I think over time we've seen um, broadly all irrigators at least have a, a, a much better awareness, certainly in the last few years, a much better awareness of their, of their opportunities and challenges and, and how they can actually um, manage the input and the rural resource for their businesses. So it, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter um, you know, the scale or size of the business. I think the, the opportunity to um, manage their, their water inputs or their water assets in a different way um, is, there for, is there for all. Yeah, I think just a note, we're getting to the point where this is a fairly mature market. I mean, trading's been around since the late 80s. Yep. You know, so if you're an irrigator and not aware that you can trade your water, I think, um, I don't think that exists. Mm. Um, just going on from that then too, I notice when any, it usually comes around inter valley trades when there's restrictions and so forth. I know a lot of water brokers um, who are highly competitive with each other get annoyed at who gets in, in first for some of these trades and usually then come the complaints that the water market is trading valuable things as, as valuable as shares but isn't as regulated as a share market. Um, do you have any thoughts on that on whether it should be moving in that direction or is it 
um, being a mature market, sort of in, in a good place as it is? John Madden? Um, I, I think there'll always be the point where some people know more than others, <laughs> whether they've sought that out or purchased an advisor or looked at the app and someone else didn't. So I think we've got to look for um, reforms or possibilities where there's um, unfair, for want of a better word. And, you know, so, for example, the operation of the IVTs, it's, well, you know, it's actually a way of educating and allocating, whether it be ballot, you know, there are various mechanisms you can actually thoroughly investigate to actually say, well, let's make the, the system fair. It's just like if you were doing a buyback in a, a company share system, you know, how do you actually register, you know, so there, there are various things we can learn from, from other markets in terms of reforming um, where some of these, um, I call it, they're more than wrinkles, but <laughs> things that we're actually starting to actually say, well, that's the next wave of reform, how do we actually manage this market? Um, and I think, I guess that's my comment around being quite explicit, how you actually prioritise those reforms across the basin. I think that's quite important. You mentioned the registers. What about a register of who owns what water, something that's a lot more searchable, like a, like a stock exchange list? Would that help the market at all? You can do that. You can do that now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's quite searchable, and um, um, it's just, you just have to pay a fee. Well, you just have to pay a fee, that's all, yeah. to get it. But look, I'd, I'd like to comment on, uh, on, the, on, on the lack of regulation for water brokers. I think it's actually, I think it's important that brokers are regulated. Um, there's, uh, I participate um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the grain futures market and that's very, very heavily regulated and, and uh, in terms of what, they, what brokers are and aren't allowed to do. And there's lots and lots of other examples, real estate and others, where you do have to, there is regulation, and look, and frankly, to be a water broker, all you have to do is put a shingle up out the front and say, I'm a water broker. And, and there are some water brokers who behave like it's the Wild West, uh, and they do whatever they like, whether the, and some, sometimes they'll trade, sometimes they'll broker, uh, sometimes they'll do both. And from an irrigator's viewpoint, it's very hard to actually deal with a, um, uh, with a water broker who is trading as well. It's equivalent to um, uh, selling cattle out of the paddock where your local agent is a cattle punter as well as a, an agent. Is he buying them for himself? Is he buying them on behalf of a meat buyer? How is it working? You don't know. And that type of, that type of phenomena is occurring in the, in the water brokerage sector. And, I, and, and I'm personally very concerned about that, and I reckon it needs to be regulated. Yeah, like trading a large amount of water into your wife's account, which yeah. we've reported on in the past. But Stuart Hodge, um, <laughs> I, I, just on that, though, regulation of water brokers, mandatory or voluntary, what would you...? Oh, well, they've got a system in place at the moment through the Water Brokers Association where they self-regulate, and frankly, it's a joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually say, I think... Um, I mean, there's two, two factors. One is, is information, and ultimately, uh, you know, as far as inside information, it's really the government agencies that have that inside information. So they have the black box as far as allocation announcements. They have the, uh, the structures around and, the, and set the rules around inter-valley trade. And so, you know, the natural resource managers and their role in the market needs to continue, you know, they need to be continually aware of, um, of what the implications uh, you know, or how that information gets out, that there's consistency uh, and, and that there's uh, clarity and an and, and ability to actually distribute to all. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's, that's you know, an incredibly important part of, of the structure. As far as you know, brokers, um, you know, I suppose it's, it's around um, you know, how does the, you know, where does the cost sit or how do you actually structure that? I think there is actually, you know, potentially there's a way, you know, we've obviously got through the um, uh, through the Victorian Water Register uh, and the new system that was created there. You know, there's certainly conditions that brokers have to adhere to in order to utilise what is a competitive advantage through using that electronic uh, um, register process to actually expedite the transfer of their water. And I think if you can use the actual market mechanisms, market mechanisms to um, you know, enforce a level of regulation as opposed to, to, to apply a, a blanket, blanket structure, I think that's possibly a way forward. Uh, we've got a question right up the back. Yeah, I'm Andre Henry from an irrigated cropping farm between Bort and Krang. Um, sort of 
emphasising on Stuart's point as well, I'd like to ask John from the Productivity Commission, is there seen as a need for reform within that space in, uh, what would you say, servicing the assets that have been put into the irrigation system? So from a productivity standpoint, seeing institutional investment enter the water market, whether it's permanent entitlement or on the temporary market as well, to get actually a beneficial use out of the water, whether an environmental or a consumptive use in irrigation, shouldn't they be in effect paying for some of this infrastructure too? Like the ability to trade within a water market and sort of a horrible term would be rent seeking on, on the back basis of trade when the actual productive use of it is actually competing in that space and paying for the assets and infrastructure that is supplying that market or, you know, using that market? Um, so I'll, I'll comment a little and I, I guess this is the, the point about what infrastructure you're paying for use. So. As far as I'm aware, um, the, the dams and the trunk infrastructure, for, for want of a better a word, would be paid by someone who sets up down in the Sun It would be paid by the CHU and others in their water prices. Um, this infrastructure here, however, in most cases wouldn't be used by those people and it's subject to a separate charge. So those things are already separated and levied separately. Um, there are cases where the CHU, I know, have used infrastructure within those systems and they've paid for it. So they've actually done contractual arrangements um, in the Murrumbidgee, uh, sorry, Murray Irrigation, for example, and used part of their systems and they're paying for it. Um, I would, uh, going back into the past, and this, this is probably not a Productivity Commission view, <laughs> but when I worked as a consultant, um, some of the investments... Um, through Enverp and the others, I don't think, thought about a future scenario of less water well enough. Um, and like, and it is a comment that we made last year about infrastructure in the north, for example. These things are liabilities in the long run and someone has to pay for them. So people think they're getting something for free and they're not because they have to be up kept, they have to be replaced particularly some of these things which maybe not have a long time frame, might be 15 years before you actually start replacing gates and, and that infrastructure. And the whole of life assessments that I saw were, I think, inadequate. And I think then the question is, well, how do you mop up a bad decision made um, jointly by the Victorian government and the federal government? It's only two billion dollars. Don't worry. Warwick, if um, I can add, if I can uh, add, just yep, briefly. Oh, yeah, quickly. Yep. So, yep. Um, a lot of feedback we've had on in in our stakeholder engagement as well has been, can you shed some more light on these trailing costs? You know, it's not just a matter of buying the entitlement and then you've got it and that sort of thing. And there's the brokerage and and those conveyancing and the like. There's actually, you know, if you're buying in a scheme, what does that mean? That you might be paying fixed charges. Uh, moving forward, you might be paying variable charges depending on how you use it uh, moving forward as well. And so um, we are working with agencies to try and draw some of that in because it's an important piece of information. Depending on where you are, depending on the nature of the scheme you're in, it's order of magnitude difference what these costs actually look like. On a different front, actually, though, uh, one of the things that we found interesting in water markets and how institutional investors are starting to come into the market and what that's doing is uh, it's been quite interesting. So, you know, one of the things we found is that with a degree of generational change happening on farms, that's hard. And having the ability to pay out mum and dad so that the next generation can come onto the farm and, and they get their superannuation effectively and can move on uh, can be really challenging. A number of parties have said to us that there are the, the presence of new instruments and the ability to actually potentially sell off water but then enter a lease type arrangement frees up capital um, to do those sort of transactions with parties. So it's interesting how the introduction of institutional investors and capital and the, the formation of these new instruments is enabling farming to continue and in, in many cases seems to be supporting that uh, generational change on farm. I'm conscious of time, so we might need to, to wrap up in just a moment, but just before we let you go, uh, panel, I'd love your insights on this, just in terms of something that you can 
leave our audience a, a trend, something that's going to happen, something for them to keep an eye on for water markets in the Southern Murray-Darling Basin. Um, we've been quite technical, we've talked about a lot of different things, but what should people keep an eye out for? Uh, Rod, do you mind if we start with you? Have you got something in your head? Prices are going up and they keep on going up. Um, and we're seeing higher value crops coming in with a willingness to pay. It's quite interesting to see, particularly where the entitlement prices are going and you know, new records are being set. Do you think that's um, going to make routinely. it difficult for dairy and rice? And those I think it absolutely is going to make it difficult. It presents an opportunity if those purchases are coming into those areas, but if they're not, then it, it presents a challenge, particularly for, for new entrants. Keep moving down the line. David, do you have... Yeah, so mine's, mine's similar uh, in that my, my understanding is a lot of these new uh, nut plantations in the southern part of the, the southern basin... Uh, they don't all have their own entitlements, so they're, they're entering the temporary market and they're entering the market to, to secure their water. So if the uh, nut plantations continue to expand, um, then that'll be something to watch. Where's that water coming from? Yeah. Stuart? Yeah, look, I certainly agree that, that water prices are certainly trending upwards. Whether or not it's sustainable or not, I don't know. Um, but um, certainly the, the, mum, the traditional mum and dad irrigators of places like the Murray Valley um, uh, are getting left behind. It's not really a, a terribly uh, fair um, playing field when there's those who have got heaps of money and and uh, superannuation. A lot of the superannuation money, for example, is uh, is spent on a um, on a funds under management. It's looked after on a funds under management type arrangement. So it's in the uh, uh, it's in the interest of those who are looking after. That um, who are administering that water asset to to get as much money invested in the water space as possible, and so when you have a, a, a rapid increase in entitlement prices like we've seen recently, I mean Zone Seven Victorian High Reliability Water Share last week, Rural Co sold a parcel for thirty seven hundred dollars a megalitre, um, and when you look at what where entitlement prices have been in recent times, that's an exponential increase in water price. And um, uh, and you can bet that the uh, the fund managers are, uh, are telling the underlying investors how wonderful the uh, returns have been in terms of capital growth on their water assets. And therefore, why don't you tip some more money in? And so it could potentially get really out of control. John Madden? Um, I guess my only comment is that trade does actually reflect... Um, over the medium to longer term, um, economic fundamentals. So I think we have to be aware of that and then think of what does that mean for my area or my business. Um, and then that's a, in those joint infrastructure areas, that's a, w a lot wider conversation than a, a few farmers. I'd love some follow-ups on that, but I won't in the interest of time, Alistair. Yeah, no, look, at, and, and I'd probably, I mean, a little bit on that as well. I think there's definitely a separation between, uh, you know, the underlying water assets and the infrastructure systems uh, that have, you know, in the past delivered that water. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how have those systems evolved to actually uh, attract... Um, new, new, new levels of, uh, of investment or new levels of, of production into those areas to actually you know, utilise that legacy infrastructure. I think that's probably a, a, you know, a key question that the infrastructure operators need to... Um, and how do they attract? That's a key question for the infrastructure operators to, to, to look at. So we've had a look at a lot of stuff there and we've been very technical in parts and if you're not from the Murray-Darling, thanks for bearing with us. But as you can see, water is one of those things where you turn one page and you find another five... 100-page documents that you should have read. Um, it is just that kind of space that can be very technical, but it's very interesting. So please thank Rod Carr, David Galliano, Stuart Hodge, John Madden and Alistair Welsh for their input. <laughs>